Welcome to a very special series of conversations diving deep into the mindset shift needed for the regenerative transition. Hosted by Emma Chow, friend of the show and active in the regenerative space for a while, she worked with many of the largest food corporations in the world and went on a deep personal regeneration journey, leading, among other things, to a love for cacao. This is the first time we host another voice on the podcast, so I hope you all give her a very warm welcome. Emma, the mic is yours. Thanks, Kuhn. It's great to be back, and this time in the hosting seat. Through six rich conversations with a range of guests, we're exploring the role of the mind. What mindset enables people to serve as regenerative leaders for a radically better food system? What are the common threads across these conversations? Well, we're about to find out. We're looking at regeneration from the inside out. This series is supported by our friends at Stray, who are exploring systemic investing with awe and wonder, as well as our friends at Mustard Seed Trust, who are enabling a transition to a care economy that fosters regenerative food systems. Thanks so much for tuning in. We hope the conversations crack the door open for you and invite you to explore new ways of thinking and embodiment towards a regenerative tomorrow. Rudolf Steiner, the father of biodynamic farming, said that carbon is the philosopher's stone, meaning it can alchemize into anything, silver, gold, whatever we desire. But today we see carbon as bad. We have too much of it. We want to get rid of it, control it. When in reality, we just have too much of it out of place. And if we get it in the right place, carbon can turn into gold, enabling healthy, vibrant living systems. What if what is holding us back is simply a scarcity mindset, believing that we don't have enough? And really what we need to begin with is our own healing, to shift our own perspective and adopt a mindset of abundance believing that we have more than enough. In this conversation, we investigate healing as our means of evolution as a society. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the show. Today, I'm joined by Cala Rose Ostrander, a founding partner of Terra Regenerative Capital, which is a catalytic fund deploying capital to scale regenerative agriculture, secure our food system, and rebalance the climate. Cala Rose has also been a strategic advisor to individuals and organizations for many years now, focusing on climate solutions. Amongst her experiences, she's played a key role in the Marin Carbon Project and Kiss the Ground's work, as well as in shaping San Francisco's climate programs. I know she'll have lots of wisdom to share with us today, Keller Rose, thank you so much for coming on the show. And we were just having a chat before we hit record because this is the first time we've connected in probably three or four years now. And it was out in California when I was there for an event back in my days at the Ellen MacArthur Foundations and, of course, focusing on food. And I remember that you you helped play a role in shifting my own mindset and how I understood carbon. And the, I knew, of course, the carbon cycle from all my studies and everything, but always heard this narrative, we have too much. And you said... It's not that we have too much, it's in the wrong place. And you did this little diagram and that stuck with me. So I wanted to kind of make this a more public conversation and firstly say thank you and give a bit of background to, to what motivated me to invite you on. Um, and yeah, I just want to start off by saying for you, and I'm asking all my guests this, when you hear the phrase regenerative mind, what comes up for you? So I love this question. And when I first heard you asking some of your other guests this question, the, the thought that came to mind was actually two thoughts. The first thought I had was really about a regenerative mind. Um, I suffered a brain injury about uh, nine years ago, and I really got to experience the power of our brains to heal and what it means when um, you've broken something. And sometimes certain things just don't come back the way they were. But all those little dendrites and neuropathways, you know, you can make grow new ones and make new pathways. And the brain is so much more elastic um, and plastic than we have thought it is. And so, you know, in my healing process, I often envisioned my mind itself, my brain itself, like regrowing new pathways or re regenerating itself. And that to me, in my mind, it looks a lot like a mycelial network spreading out or, um, 
you know, the way you can see those little electrons firing across a brain scan, if you've ever seen one of those. So I had a very visceral, you know, image of a mind, a brain regenerating. And, but I think that's different than a regenerative mindset. And from when I thought about the regenerative mindset, I really think there's a couple of things that underpin that for me. Um, again, that injury really gave me an opportunity to basically reset my mind. I think I had a lot of platforms laid out for me studying with um, Amory Lovins and uh, a couple of students of Donella Meadows, who was a great systems thinker of, of the last century, um, getting to study with Dr. Herman Daly, who was a founder of ecological economics, sort of these Western mindsets helped lay the groundwork for what I think became my regenerative mindset, uh, which really pulled on much earlier wisdom around ecology and indigenous perspectives that I had learned as a child. Um, but I think for me, the fundamental principle was when I really realized that we have enough, like we have abundance. And if we didn't have abundance, we couldn't heal. If we didn't have abundance, we couldn't extract and use as much as we currently do and actually still still have life. And the fact that our system still operates when we pull so much out of it just speaks to the abundance of the system. Um, and reading a, a couple of books about the history of synthesizing nitrogen, I think like physically we have enough um, chemical abundance in our building blocks of life with carbon and nitrogen that we don't have, we don't have a scarcity. And I think that kind of recognition, and I do mean like the, the, the definition of recognizing something that maybe you've known before, but forgotten and like really seeing that and recognizing that we have the physical capacity for, and in fact, already operate in a system that is abundant really helped shift my mindset. And I think for me, that's the, that's the basis of a regenerative mindset. Mm, thank you. Thanks for sharing that very personal story of yeah, lived experience and that relationship with the brain too. Um, and what we see in natural systems in terms of recovery and regeneration. And I love this point. I want to hone in on the abundance piece because it's come up in other conversations. And through this series, it's really interesting going into it with no expectations at all and just seeing what patterns start to emerge. And, and abundance is definitely one of them. And the other piece, which you are alluding to, is this aspect of remembrance. Like maybe it's something we hadn't learned in school or been taught before in the narratives that we're hearing. But then when we discover it and realize it for ourselves, it's sitting in this deeper place, like dwelling in this deeper part that's wise within us and just known um, through eternity. So thank you for highlighting those pieces. And you've started to reveal part of your journey for us, but I'm curious when we step back even further and look at your journey, even from childhood, was there an acute moment that sparked this sort of way of thinking in terms of the regenerative mindset? Or was it something that your parents had and, and you were just brought up with? It's such a good question. I've been thinking about it and, um, you know, you can, I could say like, oh, I think it's something I've always had, but of course that's so much a product of the environment that I grew up in and the adults that were in my life and, um, the community that I was part of. And I think, um, you know, we grew up or I grew up very, uh, how did you say this? I grew up very poor. My family didn't live in the same place until I was five and we lived all over the world, um, sort of following different jobs or needing to go to different places for different reasons, but it never felt scarce to me. It always felt um, like an adventure. And I think getting to spend so much time in the natural world, in different parts of the world, and having so many aunties and uncles who were from different cultures and who could take me on plant walks or uh, teach me about, um, you know, the physics of the stars. My dad was a, a scientist. My dad is a scientist. He's a geophysicist. And um, he had, a, you know, a lot of scientific friends. And so spending time with them and learning about science from a perspective of being outside in the world. And then also from an indigenous perspective um, with different 
friends of our family or elders in different communities, um, I think was really what gave me that as an early onset. I will also say I have to credit going to Waldorf school for 13 years and the investment my family put in and community members put into my education there. And that's a really different way of looking at the world. And I think the ability to see the whole of something and also see yourself as an individual in relation to that whole um, is a unique perspective that I don't think is taught very much in our younger educational programs, at least not in the United States. So that sort of Steiner framework um, of learning and being part of the world. Um, and again, I think then after five, we really lived in the West. And so understanding the history of indigenous cultures and being able to take part of those really shaped the way I saw things and being able to go out in the field with scientists from NIST. I grew up in Boulder. So we had friends who were scientists at NIST and NOAA. Um, these are some of the biggest national scientific institutions. Um, and that you know, in hindsight, I can say the combination of those two things, um, the hard science and the indigenous perspective plus Waldorf School, I think really gave me a different mindset um, that allowed me to approach things much more creatively and holistically. And then I think having that, you know, I think what I, my first mindset change that I went through in seventh and eighth grade was how do I speak to adults about why they should care about the environment. And that's really when I found um, Amory and Hunter Lovins and their book with Paul Hawkins called Natural Capitalism. And reading that book kind of gave me a perspective in high school and college to approach environmentalism from an economic perspective. You know, what are the economic values of this? And then learning ecological economics gave me another way to sort of value ecosystem services. So there was sort of this initial mindset for me of having to learn about how to speak to Western culture and adults about this in a term that they could understand, which really became about economics and efficiency. Um, and then I went to work in policy, which again, allowed me to look at the different levers from a more modern Western mind perspective. And I think what was the silver lining of getting a head injury that and that made made me not be able to work for about a year and a half and really not be able to work full time for about five years was I couldn't read anymore and I had a terrible short term memory and everything was too overwhelming. So I just spent a lot of time outside. And I think that's when I really remembered that regenerative mindset of observation and being part of something that was bigger than me and the abundance of the system and the interconnectedness of that system and having to rework the way I interacted in the world without my quick Western quantitative mind um, was, I think, a gift because it allowed me to remember again and recognize again that potential that is held within a regenerative mindset and within, within the regenerative mind itself. Mm -hmm. And with dance, or like interweaving between that quantitative, which are often, at least I know from my experience, to totally over index on the quantitative and hyper rational, and had buried the creative that was so vibrant in me as an adolescent. And then through adulthood, it had eroded until I had a some well, different, but an experience where I burnt out and I was forced to shut down the screen and get back into nature and that that experience brought me back to the mind and saying it's great to write reports and do analysis and everything that I've been doing and that that has a role but let's actually be in it and embody it and again that was one of the pieces of, that contributed to even shaping this series and this conversation we're having so thank you oh, for yeah. highlighting it thank you so much I love what you said about screens because I had a lot of damage to my visual cortex, I wasn't able to look at a screen. I mean, like I could look at it, but I, it was really hard to see it, let alone absorb or read what was on it. And then my short-term memory was so bad. It was like very challenging to process. Like it took me about a year and a half to read a book again. And that book was like a book of poetry. Um, 
Actually, it was the Odyssey. That was the first book I read <laughs> myself to read. I was like, I'm on an Odyssey. I'm going to read the Odyssey. It was like, you know, two pages every night for, I don't know, six months or something. But that's, I mean, that's the thing is like, we do have so much potential. And I think we forget about that potential when we're behind the screen because a certain part of our brain turns off. And at least for me, when I couldn't be behind my phone or behind my computer or watching a telev television, like I, another part of my brain really turned on and it turned on in a way that I realized my intuitive capacity was equal to my quantitative capacity. And I just hadn't been, it was there before, but I hadn't been using it. And I think, you know, that embodiment you speak about to me really became real when I was unable to be on the screen all the time. And another piece that I really realized was like, gosh, climate change is like so much faster and farther than I thought it was. And here I was behind my computer doing like San Francisco's greenhouse gas inventory, like seven ways from Friday. Like we did a, a major urban materials, like life cycle analysis and a all goods and services sold in San Francisco, like LCA with the Carnegie Mellon database and your traditional geographic inventory. And I don't know, we did five different inventories, there's like five different ways to count our carbon footprint. And, you know, after I, I hit my head, it was like, oh, well, the reality really is just like this, you know, we need renewable energy. We need to shift our, diversify our modes of transportation and we need to reconnect the cycles of nutrient and carbon flows on this planet. And that's done through our material consumption. And it was just, I almost, almost got like lost, lost in the weeds, you could say. Um, and then having that intuitive capacity come back online and just actually having being forced. And maybe, I don't know if you had this experience with your burnout, but being forced to conserve energy. Like I literally had to choose between like, am I going to take a shower today get out of bed and take a shower? Or am I going to lie here and be mad about something? Cause I don't have the energy to do both. <laughs> you know, like when you have to like conserve your energy, you really, I don't know, for me, things got a lot more simple. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. And it's interesting. You talk about the recovery, you know, it took you five years, maybe even longer to come back to working what you call full-time capacity. And even now, now I'm two years since the burnout and I've started to shed that story of like, oh, when I get back to how I was or that capacity, because it, I was working in such an extractive way that I was just leaking energy everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like I, I thought I was this, you know, unending, <laughs> <laughs> endless battery uh -huh. supply that could just be channeled into saving the world. Uh -huh. Since I was 18, I was like, that's what I'm going to do. And I could do that through my twenties. And then it was like, you're done. No more. <laughs> this this is a finite resource, our energy. Yes. And this is what I think is so yes. critical to the regenerative mind. It's like, I look around perplexed. And I, I actually struggle. I don't know what it's like for you, but I struggle to even engage with the climate solutions kind of system to the extent that I used to because of the noise. Yeah. There's so much noise and getting distracted and again, getting lost. It's so easy to get lost and forget the simplest things. Like, yeah, this experience forces, it sounds like both of us to massively simplify and get so vigilant and discern where we put our energy and, and what we commit to and what we see is true for us or not. Um, and I, yeah, thank you for highlighting that. I love it. It's so fun to talk to you about it because um, maybe we were both and are, but in a different way, like so smart, so driven, so energetic that it really was endless. And I think what I realized was just based on just like the, because when you're healing, your brain takes all the energy. So you just don't have any other energy. And so an expenditure of energy could be like, am I going to call my sister or am I going to try to talk to my boss? You know, at my old work, this was before I left. Um, you know, I, it was unclear how long this injury was going to take to heal. Um, and then like, am I going to get in a fight or an argument with somebody about something? And it had been really intense, the politics when I was right before I got injured. And we'd had a lot of forces that were really trying to shut down 
our community choice aggregation program, which was the way for the city to buy renewable energy. And I learned a lot about politics. I watched that show House of Cards because it like soothed my soul, which is terrible because it's an awful show about, I mean, it's a great show, but it's about an awful system. And like, I got so caught up in that and just the energy it takes to fight and the energy it takes to like be in that noise that you were talking about. And so, you know, when I was healing, I got to know John Wick, who I had met previously to my injury through through San Francisco when he came looking for more compost for the Marin Carbon Project. And I and I kind of got to know him while I was on medical leave. And because I because I couldn't read anything, um, I would listen to a lot of lectures by the scientists who are part of the Marin Carbon Project. And I'd listen to John talk and um uh, I had, I couldn't drive myself anywhere, obviously. So I had people who would kind of come and take me places, but, you know, in doing that, what I realized was that when I listened to them talk about the carbon cycle and moving carbon from the atmosphere into the soil where it was better, you know, and, and it wasn't bad for us in that, in the soil and the way it was an excess in the air and the way that water stacked on it and the way that nutrients stacked on it and the way it made the plants healthier and the animals healthier and the water cleaner and more available. It just, that to me gave me life. And I was like, oh, when I engage in that system, I don't get tired and I don't um, get angry and angry expends a lot of energy. So kind of out of necessity, but also out of, you know, maybe discovering a new flavor of something. It was like, oh, that's, that's the flavor I'm going to pay attention to. Because when I engage in supporting that, I actually don't feel as depleted. Um, And of course, there's just like a finite limit to the energy that you have, if you've suffered a big injury or a burnout or some sort of else of collapse in your life, a major trauma. Um, But I think, you know, the, I remember distinctly when I made the switch from thinking I was going to go back to the way I was and completely giving that up and just accepting that I was alive and that that was great (laughs) and that was enough. And just accepting that, just like accepting that maybe I was never going to read again, or maybe I was never going to be able to remember numbers again, but that I was alive and that there were good things and that, um, I could feel those good things. That was such a relief to me. Like it just, I think that moment of surrender really changed, changed my life and has, and even when I get a little bit stressed now and I think about, oh, I've got to, you know, solve this, or I wish I could weigh in on what's going on in COP, or I really would like to write a response article to the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. I just kind of pause and assess, well, like how much energy is that going to take? And usually like most of the time it's too much, you know, and versus like calling, you know, Reginaldo, (laughs) who's an amazing indigenous chicken farmer and figuring out like how we're going to make hazelnut production better next year, which seems to give me a lot more energy. And so, you know, I think paying attention to, I have a, I have an auntie who always says, you know, where your attention goes, there your energy flows. And I think for me, paying attention to where that was regenerative, where the energy came back to me and came back to the other people in the system really was a huge change in the how I approach things instead of just trying to solve every problem that came my way. Now I have to let go of a lot of problems. Yes. (laughs) Yes. This is a huge tool. And practice. It's a totally practice what you're describing because I've done it too. And I think if anyone who goes through this experience, like you have no choice but to start measuring basically in the internal scale after every interaction, right? Meeting a friend for coffee, having not just work, all these things in the day to day that we don't realize is also work. Yes. We start to say, did this, I asked myself, was this energy giving, depleting, or neutral? Mm. And seeing across my life because I know that I can't sustain it's not regenerative for me in my day-to-day to be running at high levels of depletive activities most of my time and starting to reframe I suppose even what me being making impact means in the world which used to be 
work with all the big food companies and scale, scale, what scale? And, and then it took me going through a period. I remember I was sitting at the kitchen table at my parents' house when I was just burnt out. I just went back to Canada from England and I was sitting across the table from my mom and starting to, like you, surrender to this idea that maybe I'd never go back into my job changing the food system. Mm. And I remember saying to her, I was like, what if I can never work again? My mm -hmm. idea of work, of course. Mm -hmm. And I said, what if, what if she has a cousin in New Zealand whose farm I visited before years ago? And I said, what if I went and worked at your cousin's farm? And then I sat with that longer. I go, that doesn't sound bad at all. <laughs> the farm is beautiful. <laughs> You know, it was like this whole idea of value and worthiness and how my ego was wrapped up in it. And um, if, if listeners have heard the um, interview that I did with Giles Hutchins, you'll know what I'm referring to in terms of the achiever mindset. And that's totally yeah. what was running the show so often. And still, day, in my day to day now, it's like so much unlearning still, even after going through this experience. Oh, yeah. It's like um, it's like a garden. You got to tend. You got to tend to it. Yeah. Those weeds are <laughs> just cropping up. <laughs> all the time. Right. Um, and I think, gosh, I love what you said about, you know, the farm. One of the things I recognized was um, how much more energy I got by being outside. And I think that one of the, one of my regrets is now I'm more inside and tied to the computer, but for several years, mostly because of my light sensitivity, um, which is why I wear a hat. Everybody always just thinks it was a fashion statement, but it was to hide myself from your <laughs> lights because they were very hard on my, on my visual cortex. I spent all this time outside and I had forgotten how much I knew about natural systems, but I also was so humbled by how much I didn't know about natural systems and how much yeah. they taught me just by being outside with them and by talking to farmers and ranchers and community members who are on living with them. And, um, you know, I think I, it was so interesting too, because there's this other aspect of the achiever mindset, which I think ties back to scarcity. And it's really interesting in that um, when I was an achiever mindset, there was always time scarcity. Like there was never enough time for anything, right? Um, and I was always busy. And I think not that I'm not like busy now compared to other people in the rural town I live in, but I, I was, I had such a scarcity of time. And then when I, when I wasn't in that space anymore, when I was forced out of that space, I realized that I had so much time because if I was just in the flow of something and really like slowed down enough to tap into the speed of like the trees or the speed that people were actually moving and I wasn't involved in like all the clutter and all the noise, it turns out there was plenty of time. There was plenty of time to get to the place I needed to get to. There was plenty of time to wait for that one person to make the decision, you know, we hoped that they would make. There was plenty of time to tell the story that needed to be told. Um, and I don't really understand exactly how it worked, just that my achiever mind created a false notion of time scarcity. And when I was outside and in the flow of things, I really began to understand that like there is a right timing. And if you are present and obs observing the system, like you can show up when that timing, you know, when that indication starts to come that the timing is ready, like when the harvest is ready. You know, if you're watching you know, okay, this is when it's going to be time to harvest. Um, if you're aware of what's going on outside, you can be like, oh, this is when this grasshopper is completely destroying my whatever, you know, and I, and I have this much time to really try to make a difference. Um, and somehow that made me feel a lot better because then I felt like I was part of something else and I didn't have to do everything, which then gave me so much more time. And in that time, I could just show up better. I could like listen better. I could be a better observer, like a better partner in the moment to whatever I was in, you know, relate or whomever I was relating to in that moment. And I think that's not something we get to talk a lot about in, in our kind of work work 
is just that ability to be present, which I think you really feel when you're outside. And it's a lot harder to feel when you're inside in front of a computer screen. Yes. Yes. And hearing you speak, what I'm, I was coming to my mind are several things. And one of them, I can't remember where I heard it or read it, but something around how we need to basically return and practice moving at the speed of nature, mm. which is what you just described. And I love because it's only a product, a natural symptom of separation, right? This veil of separation of thinking that we as human beings are somehow not separate and can control and now fix nature, but actually coming back into living as part of nature and remembering that I'm moving with it because it's that like hyper masculine energy and traits, right? Of trying to, to control and thinking that there's not enough. I know that was for sure for me, the propeller of all my activities was feeling like I had, I couldn't do enough. We couldn't move faster to fix things. And that took me stepping out of it altogether to say what happens when I'm completely disengage. And I took three months. Well, I took six months totally off. And I said, okay, no working for the first time in my adult life. I do not think about money, nothing. Go do what I need to do to regenerate myself. I called it a journey of self-regeneration. And I, looking back at those three months, I'm amazed because I was so dropped in and so present and not thinking about past or future. And I lived what feels like two years worth of <laughs> life experience in three months. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that because, because when you're present, like time expands, it's this interesting yes. phenomenon. And so by being present, that issue of scarcity goes away, which is counterintuitive to whatever mindset we were trained in, right? Um, maybe that's the achiever mind. But, you know, what really strikes me, and I have a question for you, is like, how did you engage with your own healing process? I was so deliberate. I have to say, because I was... I was let down when Googling what to do when burnt out because mostly in the doctors, at least here in England, we're like, let's get you on antidepressants and let's just write you off for stress. And I felt, not that I'm against medication, but I felt like that's not the answer for me right now. And and I had a meditation practice. I was actually a teacher. That was part of the irony at the time is I was even seen as like a wellness person and then burnt out. And I had my meditation teacher. I had a coach. I had a therapist and I set up a regimen. It was like I was a kid at kindergarten <laughs> and I would not every day, but I'd have certain activities that I knew were nourishing. And one of my amazing coach I was working with, she said, um, I want you to just journal every morning and answer the question of what will nourish my soul today. Not what do I need to do? What's my to-do list? Like what will nourish my soul today? And for the first time in my life, I made that my job. And at one point when I was coming back into work after a couple of months off, I was working like 10 hours a week. So I just designed my days so that I would do my two meditations a day. I'd do some sort of movement, like my whole movement practice also switched from being a lot of the yang intense energy. I grew up as a tennis player and athlete too. So that was also mm -hmm. a big part of my own conditioning to moving into the yin and the soft. I mean, like, I don't always need to be training. I can actually, I need to downregulate the nervous system out of fight or flight. Yes. Like I was working with an osteopath who told me, she's like, your diaphragm, is completely restricted. Like it's not moving. And I was, when our diaphragm's not moving, our body can't go out of um, the fight or flight nervous system into the rest and digest. So it was literally learning how to breathe and let my body start to normalize what does being in a feeling of safe, right? Safe, abundant, more relaxed state even feel like in my nervous system. And I use every tool in my toolkit and continue to, because it's, it's a continual thing. Like it's so easy. I find for me to go into the default modes and catching yeah. all the time. Yeah. I think, so I think that's like when we operate from a state of fear, it is very hard to heal. And yeah. Um, 
I, uh, I don't know why, I guess that one head injury wasn't enough. I suffered a spinal injury about four years ago that again, literally like put me on my butt. Like I couldn't move again. Oh, wow. Um, and I had to stay in place, um, for a long time. I'm just starting to be able to like be mobile again. And, you know, I was like, this time it wasn't my head, it was my body. Um, and I think, you know, I really believe that in our healing is our evolution, like personally and um, maybe epigenetically. And I think as a society, because I really do at this point, and I, I don't want listeners to take this the wrong way, but we're so sick. We're sick from stress. Maybe we're sick from the food we eat or don't eat. Um, if you're, you know, somebody who is not white, you're probably sick from racism. There's just so there's war. There's the trauma of seeing war. You know, we just have so much illness that we are fighting and so much fear. And it is so hard to heal. Um, when you're in a state of fear, whether that fear is immediate. And if it's immediate, you know, you, there's a lot more you can do in terms of like, you have a rapid response, it it goes away. And, you know, they've found now that people who are in a, in a very um, acute situation are more likely to heal than people who are in chronic situations when exposed to stress. So even if you're just, your diaphragm isn't working for a very long period of time, that sort of chronic level of stress really can prevent you healing. And so it's, it's interesting to me that, you know, you really focused in on, you had the opportunity and in a lot of ways, the privilege to do that healing. And I think one of the things I really realized was like, wow, I'm so privileged. I paid into, you know, medical leave working for the state and city of California, state of California and city of San Francisco. And I'm getting, I am, when I was injured the first time I got 50% 50% of my paycheck from a system that supported me with socialized health care. And for the second injury, I got my parents um, took me back in and I had a gift from a mentor that allowed me to like be okay. And just to take that time and recognize my privilege of healing and the time that I could like, okay, I have to heal, but also I get to heal. And I think, I don't, you know, I don't know how to say this, but we just don't often take the time to heal and it can be hard to heal if we're feeling so afraid, but I really don't think we're going to get where we want to be if we don't take the time to really see that, Hey, you know, this natural system has abundance built in. Like we wouldn't be here if it didn't, we wouldn't be able to heal if it didn't, we wouldn't be able to evolve if it didn't. And you know, how we connect with those physical structures that exist because we've created them like banks or the economy or government institutions or social systems and how we start to bring those more into alignment with the natural cycles of carbon and water and energy and just how we position ourselves to participate in those cycles and to give back to and support them to me, that's like supporting our healing. And I, I know that's like super, it's not something I go like, Hey, I'm, I work for Terry regenerative capital and you should come help us heal the planet. You know, I don't, I don't think a lot of people are ready for that, but I think that we have to understand if we're in the regenerative movement, that this is fundamentally about healing ourselves and our communities and the systems that we're participating in. And if it's not about that, it, it's not regenerative. 100% 100% agree. And and I think that's why what you described is so important because too often, in my opinion, is the regenerative movement and language around regeneration solely focused on the soil and environmental aspects that we can apparently measure um, and abstracted from our communities, our health, our individuals. And it's impossible, I believe it's impossible to participate actively in a meaningful way in the healing of our societies and our planets if we don't also heal ourselves and engage in that process and it's it breaks my heart like it I had that revelation or realization you know as I would be in my own journey and and still now and I I think about how many thousands of other people are on sick leave 
because of stress or some injury or some issue that happened and they don't have the tools, they don't have the support, um, they don't have the financial means to be able to go on that journey. And I'm more interested in how, how do we start with ourselves, start mm -hmm. within, because as the ancient saying goes, right, <laughs> as within, so without, and as yeah. above, so below. Um, and understand that it's a relationship between the two, like as, and nothing's ever perfect. It's not like, oh, I heal myself and then I'm ready to go <laughs> be in service of the world. It's like being in service of the world also helps <laughs> us heal. It's a, it's a never ending journey. It takes lifetimes. Yeah. And healing ourselves is in service of the world, right? I think that's what you're also saying is like that taking that, taking that healing and it's not to the selfish stage of like, oh, I can't be part of my community. I have to heal myself. Oh, I can't, I can't participate in alleviating the suffering of another being because I have to heal myself. Like, no, that's, that's being selfish. That's not healing. You know, and I think it's important to call out, like, there's a difference between being isolating and selfish and taking the time to heal um, and knowing that piece of it. And I think, you know, it's interesting to me because there's also this sort of this aspect of speed and I'm going to transition here a little bit. And which is just like, if we are trying to keep up with or make regenerative the same as the other systems within which we are functioning, we are not doing our job. Right. Um, but if we just try to make some regenerative, something perfect and other, and, you know, something I always have to work towards, it's like you said, it's not, it's not perfect. It's never perfect. It's a, it's about a process. And I think ultimately about relationships with ourselves, with other people, with other, you know, sentient beings, plants and animals and um, the soil and the elements and, you know, understanding both the personal responsibility and opportunity and that relational piece. And I think if we try to make regeneration just about something so specialized that you know, not everybody can participate in it, we will also have been lost. And so I think where I sort of see myself right now in terms of quote unquote work is how and where do we connect the existing sort of mm, socioeconomic systems that Western culture has created back into supporting the healing of land and people and it's not going to be perfect. There's going to be a lot of weird, like <laughs> strange chimeras of different iterations. But I think that if we begin to make those connections and foster those relationships by bridging pra quote unquote practical reality with the questions of like, does this support healing? Does this support natural function of carbon, water and nutrient cycles? Does this regenerate um, is this within the system of abundance? Are we not only taking, but are we also giving back? And I think that's where it's so interesting because we take a tremendous amount as humans and we're never not going to take, like we have clothes and we love them and we need food and uh, we need water and people love to do things because we're active and we're curious and you know, we're strange creatures. So we're always going to take something. But I think there are two things that we can really do that are regenerative is to understand how we foster the life and the taking of the thing such that it is having its best life or participating in life in a way that is positive um, and beneficial. And maybe that's an animals, you know, like tree range farms, the chickens are outside under trees we're still going to eat them, but they're living their best life in a, in a habitat where they are originally from, which is a jungle like habitat. And they're having, they're living a good life. And then the question is like, at the end, how do we give back? And that's, I think why I get so fixated on, um, <laughs> I always come back to compost. Like at the end of the day, if there's anything I want anybody to do, it's to learn how to compost or to participate in composting, because then you get to see like, how much more we get when we give back at the end of a cycle. And I also like to think about how there isn't really, well, there is pollution. I mean, you can't say there isn't, but pollution is just an element that's out of place. Like we've moved it from one place where it was participating in a synergistic function 
into another place where it, it can't, it's stuck. Either it's in a chemical form that it's bound up in and it can't get out of, or it's too much in the atmosphere and not enough in the soil, or um, you know, there's too many nutrients in water when they need to be in, in living matter and not in liquid. Um, they're just out of place. And so if we can start to think about how we make things by moving things back into place, by recycling, by composting, by um, undoing and such that the undoing of something is the redoing of something else, um, that that sort of circular economy, which I know you and I talked about before, when seen not just as like, what's the next reuse of this thing, but how does the unmaking or remaking of this thing strengthen or participate in natural chemical and biophysical and elemental cycles of the planet that drive life, then I think we begin to integrate our behaviors and habits as humans, which have been framed as so destructive because they, they, they are, and they can be into something that can actually be regenerative and restorative. And that it's, it's not necessarily like, oh, human behavior is just all bad. I mean, a lot of it's not great, let's be honest. But at the same time, like we have such potential to move those natural behaviors into being supportive of the systems that support us. And I think that's where there's just so much work to be done, but it's not fast work because it's synergistic work. And when one piece clicks into place because you've helped reconnect a system, you're not just bringing one piece online, you're bringing that whole system back online. And I think that's where it's like, so regenerative, because it takes time to reconnect one piece back into the natural system. But when you do, the whole force and weight and power of that system comes with it. And then, you know, we're not acting alone. So it was a long diatribe, but I, I think a lot about those cycles these days and like how we can support them and how much we can do in the unmaking and remaking to support them if we're able to step back and really observe and learn about the larger systems that we're part of. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's this piece around uh, remembering that nature isn't linear and it may take, as you're describing, a long time to get that piece that's out of place back into place. And then that recovery can actually happen quite quickly, um, maybe beyond what we might believe or, or what we might be analyzing as or modeling. Um, and I want to connect, give you a chance to, because I'm curious, to describe how, how did Terra of Capital come to be and how does that how is it serving all of what you just described? I won't even try and paraphrase paraphrase that last um, bit that you shared with us. Well, thank you for asking and bringing us um, back on track. And thanks also for having a an endeavor that is not about a specific track, but the exploration. Um, I really appreciate that. So one thing that I learned when I was um, recovering was that Rudolf Steiner, who is the founder of the biodynamic agriculture and Waldorf schools and homeopathic medicine and a bunch of other stuff, he actually called carbon the philosopher's stone. And I thought about that and I was like, oh, that's fascinating that the stone that can turn into gold or in other fables that can turn into anything, the way Steiner used that metaphor in his description of the planet was as carbon acting as philosopher's stone. So I think I, I kind of was like, Oh, okay. So if we are, if we are working with the philosopher's stone and agriculture is such an amazing way, you know, agriculture via photosynthesis is the single biggest way humans manage carbon on the planet that is participatory within a natural cycle. And it's not just like we're burning fossil fuels and moving that into the atmosphere um, but like within us, the carbon, the life cycle of carbon, that, that photosynthetic capacity of the plants and the management of that via agriculture was such a strong way to sort of work with this philosopher's stone. So with Terra Regenerative Capital, I was building on, you know, nine years of experience within regenerative ag, having come from a science perspective, having worked with the state of California on rolling out their natural and working lands climate programs, integrating natural and working lands into their climate policy framework, which actually is extraordinarily challenging because 
climate policy framework we have is built on the Kyoto Protocol and the EPA Acid Rain Program, which are both point source emissions pollutant programs. And so we continue to treat climate change like a point source pollutant program. And even when we talk about sequestration, it's sort of a one, one, two move. It's not a one, two, three, four, five. It's not a cycle. So something about that quote of thinking about the philosopher's stone, which can turn into anything kind of really drove me to think about all the ways in which our systems push or pull or attract carbon and how we move it around the planet. Um, and with Terra Regenerative Capital, it's really a private sector approach. Now, it's not, we're not a venture capital fund. And I think this really speaks to the, make sure that the structure of the thing you're creating is in alignment with the outcomes you want. And knowing that things take time, especially in agriculture, because they have to physically grow and people have to physically learn how to grow them. Um, and they take time to build um, large facilities for processing and manufacturing. Knowing that these things take time and knowing that they're biological, um, we really couldn't do a VC fund. Um, the traditional fund structure just didn't work for us. It didn't work for us for a number of reasons. One, we didn't think we were going to get any sorts of like unicorns <laughs> that were going to somehow save the whole portfolio. We also didn't think that we could exit within 10 years with everything. And we didn't, even with the things we wanted to and felt like they could grow or move or exit from our fund faster than 10 years, we didn't want to be under time pressure. So what I love with Terra Regenerative Capital, and I'm so lucky to be working with Tara Smith, who is my co-founder and whose family is our anchor investor in the fund, is that we have structured the vehicle of the fund itself, which is a public benefit LLC, to be supportive of the nature of the things that we're trying to cultivate. So this allows us to manage not for the speed of exit um, or a high, high risk, high reward sort of exit scenario that VC is traditionally known for, but to manage for the nature of the asset itself and the maturation of that and um, the evolution of that such that um, we think that those companies that we're investing in and we invest in companies that are in the middle of the supply chain. So folks who do aggregation, processing, manufacturing, and distribution that help connect farmers who are growing regeneratively into value-add markets or into markets that they wouldn't be able to get to on their own we think that that is both an important piece of connecting in this existing system of economics to supporting the change in agricultural production and incentivizing that through market access. So really utilizing that, you know, economic incentive while also creating it, creating a vehicle structure and managing, um, you know, being really honest about our expectations. And I think what's interesting is that we're seeing that a lot of what we're doing, we feel like is lower risk, but maybe not as high reward as, as what a VC would expect, but maybe we can get a market rate return. And that I think is fair. It's like slowing it down a little bit. It's like saying, okay, money, you're used to moving really fast. What if you just slowed down a little bit? Um, what if you just took a little bit less of a gamble and a, maybe a little bit less of a reward? Uh, would that be okay? You know, would, would <laughs> dear money managers, would you be okay with that? <laughs> um, and, and if so, then, you know, here are all of the other benefits, um, rural job creation, carbon sequestration, you know, resilience to high heat or water events, you know, all these other benefits, wealth development, ownership of assets. We hope to structure a lot of our exits to return to employee and community ownership because, we believe that the value of these businesses is much greater for the communities than it would be for a traditional private equity firm. Just from like a balance, a checkbook standpoint, like private equity firm is not going to get a lot out of a small batch of Midwestern processors, but all the communities in which those processors exist are going to be able to build their livelihoods with those processors existing in them. So you know, the, the non-monetary value and the economic impact value is so much greater for the employees and farmers and communities that these businesses exist within, that that's part of also our structure is from the beginning, we really try to look at how are there ways that we can get started on now such that 
this community or these communities have the opportunity to buy us out and to have us exit out of this in a way that we are able to return money to our investors, but also ultimately return the assets and their value to the communities um, from which they source products. Thanks for sharing all of that. And yeah, the highlighting this piece around, well, it's very experimental and, and designing the vehicle with these honest expectations. And through this journey, I imagine you're bumping up against all different types of personalities and mindsets um, <laughs> on the spectrum of degenerative to regenerative, if we can use that language. What do you find is effective so far in maybe getting those who are earlier in the journey to start buying in and, and understanding this approach and seeing value in it? You know, um, I'm, I'll just be honest and say Terra Regenerative Capital is mostly for people who have been in this space for a long time and they understand the very strategic value that this particular venture and asset classes um, bring to the space. And it's um, like, I'm, I'm not going after somebody who's going to be investing in an ag tech solution that may help reduce, you know, glyphosate application, which is great. I have nothing against that. We, you know, we want our farmers to start using those things, but Terra Regenerative Capital is not for that group of people. It's for people and investors, family offices, foundations, um, individuals who have been in this space for a long time and recognize that it's providing a very strategic value that takes a ton of time <laughs> to do well and takes a deep level of connection to do well. Um, and that is the value that we believe we're providing is a level of thought and thoughtfulness and then connection within that broader system um, to really deliver what we believe are going to be systemic changes and and strong financials, I think we're aiming for between 6 and 12% on return. Um, and, you know, I think we are going to see the birth of a new agricultural system in the United States, either outside of the federally supported commodity system, or maybe we'll get that system to gradually turn and support the alternative system as well. Um, but Terra Regenerative is not for the beginner. I think I do a lot of other work. I have a little podcast called Rain and Shine. It's five minutes. It's about nature and science. It's a really nice way for someone who doesn't know a lot about science or regeneration to just kind of connect in. I think, you know, continuing to work and support ground uh, films like Kiss the Ground and Common Ground um, and all these other amazing, you know, pieces of communication and uh, education systems that help people off off ramp is is really wonderful, but Terra Regen was created for those who are deep within the movement and are ready to take the next step towards actually creating structural change. Got it. And I suppose apart from tuning into your little podcast, um, this is a question I ask all my guests. I'm curious to hear your answer. If you could do one thing tomorrow to help decision makers or these other investors, perhaps who are earlier on the journey, um, develop a regenerative mindset, what would it be? Um, two things. I, the first thing I would do is I would really be like, so, you know, that fewer than 4% of venture, venture backed equity funded companies achieve exits within eight to 10 years. <laughs> like you're aware of this. Do you, do you understand? I just like put some data in front of people, like the system that we currently are banking on to support innovation is just a, it's, it's not going to work for the, for agriculture and B, is it even really like, does the emperor actually have clothes? And 80% of all venture funded companies fail within five years. Like, I think there's, I think there's a lot of just like, let's be sober and look at the reality of these systems and their capacity to create the changes we have agreed that we want to create. And then, and that I think is just like a little bit of like a, let's be honest about what's going on and just stop and take a minute. And then the second thing is, and I would do this for everybody in whatever position they're in. <laughs> it's just like teach them to compost. If if people can compost with their communities, if they can compost at the school they're at, 
if there's composting at work, if there's composting on a farm, if their restaurant talks about their food scraps being taken away to be composted and grown to the food. I have seen people shift their mindset more towards regenerative when they understand and participate in composting than I have in any other thing. I mean, I think I think if you are both blessed and cursed with a trauma that you have to recover from, there's an opening and an opportunity to learn a regenerative mindset, as we've talked a lot about on this on this show. But I think that in general, I have never... I have never met a person, A, who didn't like composting. I mean, maybe people are like, oh, that's stinky, but they don't, maybe they just had bad compost. Um, But I've never (laughs) met somebody conservative, wealthy, poor, liberal, uh, not from the United States. Like everybody thinks composting is great. And when they take the time to really think about it and learn about it, their shift towards understanding that we don't live in a scarce system, that there is abundance, that if they help life, like if not if they buy something, not if there's a new technology, but if they just help life do its job, great things happen. So the thing I always come back to at the end of the day is I just wish that everybody, for everybody, has an opportunity to learn how to compost and to participate in composting in some way because I have seen so much incredible joy and learning and development of human community come from that than I have from probably any other, not probably, definitely than any other single environmental thing. And you don't have to live in nature outside of town. You can live in a city, you know, Korea has the best, South Korea is some of the best composting in urban cities in the world. New York um, has composting. Los Angeles has community composting. I mean, there are opportunities for that particular activity to exist everywhere. And my hope is that everybody everywhere gets a chance to participate in that because it opens, I've seen it open people's minds and hearts so many times again and again. It's a way for, yeah, all of us, no excuses to, (laughs) I love that line, understand how to let life do its job and also build community, which is part of contributing to life and get the facts on the table, which is also so needed and, and no false comparisons anymore. So I think that's a perfect point to wrap up our conversation. Thank you so much, Keller, for coming on. It's been such a joy. We could go on for hours and hours, but I'm looking at the clock and going, listeners will need to move on at some point, so maybe there'll be future episodes. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you really on a personal level, and I would love to learn more about your journey, and thank you for sharing it and with me today, but also thank you for sharing it via this um, this show and you know, with the broader world. And I hope that it gives people um, the bravery and the hope and the courage and to, to step off into their own journey, whatever that may be. Likewise. Thank you. And for listeners, that was not planned. I didn't even know <laughs> Keller Rose's background with the injuries and things, but that's what was meant to come through. So I'm sure it's, it's serving at least some listeners, if not many. <laughs> today. So thank you. Hey, anyone who's ever burnt out or anyone who's ever had a traumatic head injury or a big injury like if we are supportive if we support each other if we have you know families chosen or or biological that can support us we can heal and and that healing is the regeneration and i really believe that that healing and regeneration is our evolution absolutely thank you thank you Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you like this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.